Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. We will be start uh, talking about intestinal protozoa today. Uh, part 1 is Giardia. Now, at the end of the lecture, you should be able to at least learn the parasite biology, pathogenesis and clinical manifestations of the disease caused by it, diagnosis of the disease, treatment and how do you prevent and control the disease. Now, Giardiasis is an intestinal infection caused by intestinal protozoan Giardia lamblia. It causes watery diarrhea alternating with greasy stools and it is the trophozoite of this is seen in this figure. Uh, this is a morphological form which is active and motile. Now, GIDS is spreads through contaminated food or water by person to person contact. It is most common in areas where poor sanitation is there and unsafe water is there and the infection occurs in many animals including beavers and hence its name uh, nickname as well as cows, rodents, sheep. They play a role in the uh, keeping the infection in, uh, prevalent in the environment. It was first described by Dutch microscopist Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek in 1681. The genus is named after the French zoologist Alfred Matthew Giard, G and it is a genus of anaerobic flagellated protozoan parasites. About 40 species have been described from animals. Five to six morphologically dif distinct species are recognized. Giardia lambilia, which is also known as Giardia intestinalis, is Giardia duodenalis, infects humans and other mammals. Duodenalis, it is subclassified into eight genetic assemblages designated A to H, and assemblages A and B infect the largest number of host species and appear to be the main which infect humans. Now, it has got two morphological forms mainly in its life cycle trophozoid and cyst. Now, trophozoid is a peer or a tennis racket shaped clown faced um, structure while cyst is an oval shaped structure. Now, this has got the size of 10 to 20 by 5 to 15 micro millimicron while cyst is smaller 11 to 14 by 7 to 10 millimicron. This has got two nuclei and the, you know the chromosome material is condensed in the center. So, it appears like clown eyes and there are while this has got four nuclei, the cyst has four nuclei. This has got two adhesive discs by which it attaches to the intestinal cells and there are four pairs of basal bodies which are there and four pairs of flagella are present in tro uh, trophozoid. While none of these are there in the, there are no flagella in the cyst and the remnants of the axoneme and basal bodies, remnants of the parabasal bodies are there. Um, this has a pair of axonemes which is going down and it is in the active swimming form or motile form of the organism while cyst is the uh, infective and the resistant form by which the infection is uh, carried from one organism one uh, host to another. Now, habitat basically Giardia lives in the intestine of infected humans or other animals and it completes its life cycle in one host. Transmission is through fecal oral route with the ingestion of cysts. One can be infected by ingesting the cyst or coming in contact with contaminated food, soil or water tainted by feces of a, an infected carrier. The cyst can remain infectious for up to 3 months in cold water. So, it spreads either through a contaminated surface, blanket, door knob, whichever is contaminated and then that hand goes and touches your mouth and you take the organism to your mouth through contaminated food or water or rarely by sexual route and this could be seen mainly in homosexuals. Now, Giardia lamblia also known as Giardia intestinalis is a flagellated parasite like I showed you. It colonizes and reproduces in the small intestine causing giardiasis. It attaches to the epithelium by the ventral adhesive disc that it has and it reproduces by binary fission. Giardia does not spread via bloodstream nor does it spread to other parts of the GI tract. It remains confined to the lumen of the small intestine. They, the trophozoites that attach there, they absorb the nutrients from the lumen of the small intestine and they are basically anaerobes that is they do not uh, need oxygen for survival. As far as pathophysiology is concerned, there is no invasion of Giardia trophozoids 
and the small intestinal morphology is seen to be normal in light microscopy. Main mechanisms by which it causes damage is decreased expression of the brush border enzymes or it causes morphological changes to microvillus or it also causes programmed cell death of the small intestine epithelial cells. So, finally, the pathophysiology comes about that is the disease or the diarrhea that is presented. In the life cycle, the cyst is ingested by the host and it goes and becomes uh, loses the cyst form that is excistation occurs and true torphocytes are released in the duodenum which, which has the active state of feeding and motility and they ex multiply asexually, they attach to the duodenal mucosa by adhesive disc and they again uh, produce more trophozoids. Now, these trophozoids can be extruded in stool and pass through the digestive system, they also call the encystation occurs. So, cysts as well as trophozoids for are found in the feces. Cysts are the ones which survive outside while trophozoids uh, die very soon once they come out. So, this is, this is the cycle, this contaminated food or water which is there, cysts can pass into the human being and they multiply in the GI tract into trophozoids and cysts and which pass out. Now, if you want to see this uh, clearly, this goes, cysts, the uh, excistation occurs, multiplies, trophozoids come out and so finally, the trophozoid uh, comes out along with some encysted forms. So, the risk factors are, greatest risk is are to travelers in countries or those who are in close contact with you know, someone who has the disease people in childcare settings or who swallow contaminated drinking water, backpackers or crampers who drink untreated water from lakes or rivers, the people who have contact with animals who have disease are the ones who are at risk of the disease. Now, as far as symptomatology is concerned, some people have no symptoms or it could be just asymptomatic or and can have acute or chronic stage. Acute stage, there can be a watery diarrhea alternating with greasy stools, chronic stage, patient can have fatigue, cramps and belching, wind etc. or he could become a carrier and transmit the infection and many cases though many cases clear up on their own and within a few weeks without any treatment. So, the main things which can occur is one is pain areas, pain in the tummy and bad pain one can have or one can have gastrointestinal symptoms that is diarrhea, belching, bloating, indigestion, nausea, one can have excessive amounts of gas, vomiting, flat, flatulence, very non-specific symptomatology can be there. Or one can have a whole body fatigue, loss of appetite, malaise, malnutrition. Sometimes one can have common things which can be cramping, failure to thrive, foul smelling stool or weight loss. So, these are all chronic symptomatology which can occur or one can have acute symptomatology, pain and GI symptoms. Now, for diagnosis, one means mainly needs to demonstrate the motile trophozoids or cysts in the stool. So, microscopic examination of stool is important. Repeated stool examination should be done, at least 3 stools should be taken. Sensitivity of stool examination may ranges from 60 to 70 to 90 percent, but one should concentrate the stool sample by zinc sulphate salt concentrate or formal ether concentration. And after concentration, one can make iodine in saline mounts or one can make trichome strain which can be done of the preserved stool to be able to detect the gradia. In iodine stain, you can see the cysts which are yellow stain or you could see the strophozoids in some of the other stains which can be used. Then or one, what one needs to do is sometimes you still cannot demonstrate anything in the stool. So, what can one can do is an entero test. Now, what is an entero test? In this a gelatin capsule is attached with a thread and this is attached to the inner aspect of the cheek of the patient. And then this thread is swallowed, later the thread is withdrawn and this is shaken in saline to release the trophozoids which can be detected within the uh, under the microscope and this is taken from the duodenal or the jejunal uh, area. Now, what is seen is that Giardia lamblia is difficult to detect sometimes. This can often lead to a delay in diagnosis or misdiagnosis. Several tests therefore need to be completed over a period of time. Many times patient will keep having the symptomatology, but you cannot demonstrate the, uh, the organism. Until you demonstrate, you cannot be sure. So, what one needs to do sometimes, one has to do detection of antigen on the surface of organisms in stool samples, so, which is the current test of choice for diagnosis of GRDSs. It has an increased sensitivity more and over the common microscopy techniques that has done and what you can do is either you can detect the antigen by ELISA test or you could do direct fluorescent antibody staining. You could see, you could stain and look at the um, uh, trophozoids or cysts if they are present and this increases the sensitivity compared to normal microscopy. 90 percent detection rate is more by these methods. 
Now, treatment is not always necessary as the infection usually resolves on its own, but when illness is very acute or symptoms persist, one needs to give nitrimidazole, albendazole one can take or tinidazole, secnidazole or ornidazole one can take, but resistance is developing to these drugs. So, one might have to go on to quinacrine, nitroxanide, bacitracin, zinc, furosolidane or paramomycin, drugs might have to be used in the long run. Now, epidemiology if you try to understand, you will see that it is usually associated with poor hygiene and sanitation, person to person transmission accounts for the majority of the infections, waterborne transmission is associated with the ingestion of the contaminated water, food borne epidemics have also developed through the contamination of food by infected uh, food handlers. Additionally, diaper changing and inadequate hand washing techniques are important risk factors in infected children. Venereal transmission has also been seen to take place through fecal oral route. So, all these could be important factors in epidemiology and in the continuous uh, uh, endemic nature of the GRDI in environment. As far as prevention is concerned, CDC recommends hand washing and potentially avoiding uh, contamination of food and water by the main method to avoid in GRDI infection. Chemical disinfectants or filters can also be used. Boiling suspect water for one minute is the surest method to make water safe to drink and kill disease organic causing organisms. So, by for prevention basically it is the hand washing techniques having the safe water or by disinfectants of filtration or by boiling for one minute and this can help to uh, prevent the infection in the long term. Thank you so much.